couples that ended up getting married, I always look back on their first few dates to see what they said. The men are usually smitten on the first date and they're like, this is it. This is my person. Or at least they're really excited to go on that second date. And the women are usually not there yet. Like they're more cautious. So there's something about them that's interesting and they're willing to give it another shot, but it's not until the fourth or fifth date when they're like, wow, this is my person. Welcome to the Asian Dating Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. Her name is Talia Goldstein. Before I introduce you to her, I just wanted to say welcome to the Asian Dating Podcast, where I help single women just like you go from frustrated with dating to having a positive, unfair advantage dating strategy. So no matter if you're experienced or inexperienced, I would like to help you out in this dating world. And of course, with podcasts, we give great dating tips. And I always have the best guests come on and to give us the real deal about dating. And today is no different. I have Talia Goldstein, who is the president and founder of Three Day Rule Matchmaking, an exclusive matchmaking company for busy professionals. Talia has been featured on various news outlets from NPR to Good Morning America to CNN. And I've known her since since 2010. And we've been friends for a long time. And we've matched together and give dating tips to each other or business advice to each other. And just welcome to the show, Talia. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to catch up. Thanks for having me. Well, today we're just going to talk about dating, of course. And I know, Talia, you've been in this business since 2010. Like, how did you get started? Like, how did you get from doing what you were doing to now? Like, what are you doing? Tell us about <laughs> yeah, Quite the journey. So I started the company while I was working at E! True Hollywood Story in Los Angeles. I was a segment producer there. And it just sort of started by accident. I loved giving relationship advice from my cubicle. So I would give people advice and I started to pair up my friends and my coworkers and realized I had this hidden talent in matchmaking. All these couples were getting together and getting engaged. So I began hosting events so I could bring my coworkers and my friends together in larger locations. And they became pretty popular. So we had about 30 people at our first event, then 300, then 600. We were taking over these huge hotels around Los Angeles. And it was really at one of those events. It was at the London West Hollywood where I realized that something was missing in the market. And so I decided to quit my TV job and start the matchmaking company. That is pretty brave. I mean, to just go from, let me just host events and get my friends together to, you know what, I think I'm going to quit this major TV gig and do matchmaking because Back in 2010, it wasn't that popular, right? To do matchmaking or to have a dating agency. So yeah. It was, we didn't even have the apps at the time. So all we had was eHarmony and Match and JDate and then the Millionaire Matchmaker. There was nothing in between. So to be honest, before I quit television, I took on a handful of clients because I wanted to make sure that people would actually pay me to do matchmaking. So I had my TV job during the day and at night I would do the matching and I didn't even know how much to charge to begin with. So I remember I walked into a club one night and I saw a guy trying to pick up on a girl and I said, I can do this for you. Bring me $250 cash to Starbucks tomorrow and I'll take over. And he showed up and he gave me the cash and that was my first client. And then I tried it again with someone that I met off of Facebook and I charged her $500 and I just kept increasing the price until I could figure out like how much people would pay. And once I had that, I felt comfortable leaving my full-time job. That's awesome. I remember I started in 2009, I think, probably a little bit before you. And I too quit my corporate job. I used to work for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. I was a regional manager. My first job out of college, washing cars, renting cars. I was a management trainee and when I turned 30, I actually signed up for Great Expectations. Uh, they were on Wilshire and it was video dating. And then when I signed up, I paid them, I think it was like five grand or something. And I thought, gosh, I could totally do this better than them. I could totally be a better matchmaker than these people that I paid money to. So 
But then it was always on the back of my mind, like, oh, I should start that dating company. I should start that dating company. And I did try to apply to work for Patty Stanger. And I emailed them and I got an email back from them saying, you got to read the book first. Like that's what they were pushing her book that just came out. Of course I did buy her book. And then I didn't want to apply with them because I'm like, wait, I could totally do this myself. So yeah, that's kind of how I started. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Like there are so many different backgrounds from, you know, matchmakers now, like they used to be a real estate agent. They used to be a lawyer. They used to be sell. They used to be a teacher, like all across the board, like just crazy. Yeah. It's so interesting because we have now like about 50 full-time matchmakers across the country and people are always curious what resume, like when you look at a resume, what are you looking at? And the truth is it's not, has nothing to do with their background. It's all soft skills. So you could come from any profession and be a great matchmaker. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So tell me about your top matchmaker. You don't have to give me their name or anything like that, but what makes them so good at their mm -hmm. job? Yes. I mean, we do have some amazing matchmakers. One comes to mind. She is incredible. I truly, I don't know how she does it, but she makes everyone, well, first of all, she genuinely cares. Like she wants success for them, regardless of how much they pay. Like it has nothing to do with that. She just really cares deeply about every client and she's very thoughtful. So in the intake meeting, she's really going deep with them because a lot of what our job is, is listening to what they're looking for and then reading between the lines. So she does an amazing job, just really going deep to understand and she's very proactive. So she'll never wait for the client to reach out to her. She's on top of it, always asking for calls and catching up. And she's just spot on with the matching and her intuition. And she has so many success stories that a lot of her clients buy packages for their friends and family. Like it just keeps going. Like they'll match successfully and then they'll buy a package for someone else and pay it forward. So She's really, it goes above and beyond. That's interesting when you said that she reads between the lines. So what do you mean by that? Like, is there something that a client would say that they want or need? And then she or another matchmaker would give them someone different or give them someone like, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Like a simple example is when a woman comes and says, I want someone that makes $500,000 a year. So reading between the lines, that's not actually what you're looking for. It doesn't really make a difference if it's 500,000 or 250,000. What she's looking for is stability. And so that it's taking what they're saying and interpreting it to what they mean. Right. Yeah. Because 500,000 a year is like probably the top 1% or something, right? It's not like everyone can easily make 500,000. I mean, that's a lot of money. I don't think sometimes people realize that, but um. Yeah. So, or you can make $500,000 and spend it all and have nothing or be a saver, you know, so it's kind of irrelevant and just, there's so much more to that. Right. Right. So when people are dating, um, what kind of questions could a woman ask a man that would kind of get her, give her an idea of what kind of lifestyle he leads or mm -hmm. give her an idea if he is stable or if he's a spender or a saver, like what are some not so intrusive questions they can ask, but still kind of give her an idea of what kind of man or provider he is. Yes. Well, first of all, I would not ask a handful of questions at the same time, because <laughs> sometimes we'll get the feedback from the men. I'm like, I know what she's doing. This is what she's trying to figure out. So space out the questions over a handful of dates. I think travel style is a really big one. I mean, it's important to have a similar travel style in general, but if you're talking about vacationing, you know, where do you like to vacation? How do you like to vacation? You can find out if it's more hostels versus four seasons, because a lot of this is lifestyle. And then you can throw in questions that are fun just to hear their take. Like if you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do? Because maybe they're a saver, maybe they'll blow it all on watches, you know, just kind of little hints into what kind of a like lifestyle they want to lead. So and then obviously career goal, like simple ones are career goals. You know, where do they see themselves? But again, it must be spaced out or they'll know exactly what you're going for. 
So are you saying that men can figure out if a woman is a gold digger or not? Like he can pretty much tell like, oh, this person is just asking me about how much money I make or what kind of car I like to drive and that kind of stuff. Like, how do you, do you get a lot of women like that or no? It's not even gold diggers. And we don't really work with that clientele. There are other matchmaking companies that sort of focus on like wealthy men and young yeah. women who want wealthy men. That's not really our vibe. It's more that they know you're, what you're fishing for. You know, they're wanting, they're, some women make it pretty obvious that you're asking how much money do you make? And are you going to, you know, have enough to buy a house one day? So it just has to feel a little bit more organic or it feels more like an interview. So to make things more organic, what would you ask a guy? Like you would say, oh, so where do you live? How long have you lived there? You know, do you do house repairs to see if he's a <laughs> homeowner? Like what, what kind of questions can you ask to see how stable he is? Or, you know, mm -hmm. if he has a house at age 40 or whatever that may be. Yes. I mean, you can ask those questions. It's certainly about the career. Like, what do you, what do you do? And do you enjoy it? What are you most passionate about? Where do you see yourself going from here? Like, you can ask those types of questions. You don't have to completely avoid it. It's just, if you ask six questions in a row, then that's what it's all about. And right. you can, you know, where do you live? Oh, do you have roommates? Right. You can, you can yeah. definitely sprinkle in those questions. It just has to be among other topics. Right. Right. Okay. So knowing what you know now, since you've been in the business since 2010, what are some key things that you've learned that are relevant to setting people up? Like what are some major factors that this is what you really need to focus on to make sure they're a good match? It's goals. A huge one is timeline. I've set up so many couples that I thought were the perfect couple, but they had different timelines. So it didn't work out. Core values is probably number one. And then attraction, like it's, it's hard. It's a combination of all those things, but I would say probably the most important is future goals and timeline. Yeah. I think dating, a lot of it has to do with timing too, right? Like you could put the perfect guy in front of her, but if she just got out of a relationship like three weeks ago, she's not going to be ready to focus mentally on dating right now. So um, that comes with my other question, like, how long should someone wait if they just broke up before they start dating again? Like, do you have like a, like a yeah. number or something for them? No. And I think a lot of it depends on their age and their goals. So for example, we, we had a client, she was at the time 39 and we matched her with someone and they dated eight months. And we were going out celebrating like, this is it where she's going to get engaged. We were so excited for her. And then out of nowhere, he broke up with her and she really wanted marriage and a family. So at that point she was 40 and she was grieving this relationship, but because of her goals, she didn't have that much time to grieve. So we decided, let's just get you back out there. Well, you know, you could heal while we're working together and we did, and we matched her with another guy and they ended up within the year getting engaged, and married, and she just had a daughter. So like in her situation, she just, she didn't have years to grieve because of her goals. And so we just got right back out there. And fortunately she was working with the matchmaker so we can help her through all of that. But if you're fresh out of a divorce and you're in your fifties and you know, you're not, you don't need to have a child tomorrow, then you can take a little bit more time to grieve and get to know yourself again. So I think it's dependent. It's really case by case. There's no, it's not really one size fits all, but a lot of it has to do with what chapter in your life you're at. Yeah. That's a good point. If your goal is to start a family, it's like, okay, you got to get back out there. You got to go and go, go, go meet someone else. Who's great. And at least she knew she was, that's what her goal was, right. To start a family, find a great guy. Um, yeah. Which comes to my other question. I know women, uh, we all have a biological clock, right? The ladies do. But guys, do men have a biological clock? Do they act like they have a biological clock? Or do they just think, oh, I could be 69 and I could still get married and have kids like all some of the uh, actors do? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is there a cutoff for men? That's a good question. 
I don't think they have that clock. I have so many clients that are 50s, 60s, ready to start a family. I think there comes a time where they yearn for that. You know, they all their friends are getting married and having kids and they really want that, but it's not as much of a pressure situation as some of the women are in. Like they have more time as their luxury. So we certainly like we're matching clients like up until their 60s that want to start a family and they don't seem to feel a lot of pressure. I mean, with today's technology and things like that, I mean, didn't Hillary Swank just have twins at what? Yes. She like 40, she was like 47 or something. 47. Right. One thing I noticed just over the last few years is that men are really, how do I say this? They're educated on egg freezing. So they will say, okay, I will date a woman who's 35, unless she has her eggs frozen, then I'll go up to early forties. So that is something new that I've just noticed that they're really more aware of that option. And so it's widening the age range. Yeah, that is true. I do have a client right now who said I would date 39 and under, but if she has her eggs frozen, I would go up to 42. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Men are being more educated in that, which is great. So what do you believe a woman's age range should be like who she should meet? Like if she's 30, Mm -hmm. what age range is good for her to meet that are of the age of the men? Mm -hmm. Usually our rule of thumb is up to eight years older. If someone is willing to go older than that, fantastic. But when we're doing the matching, we stick within the range up to eight years older. Okay. The match might be a few years younger up to that range. And then we'll look at all these other factors within the range, like energy level and maturity and timeline. Like there's more that goes into it, but that's usually what we're sticking to. So the men you would say were open to searching for you eight years younger like that, like the men that also have that eight year gap or we usually do eight years. But again, if they're open outside of the eight years, then we'll, we'll look at that too. When I look at the data, it's interesting. Like typically the success stories are actually around the same age, but I find it's helpful to have the range because you could have someone who's 40 that feels 30 and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you said a three day rule is nationwide, right? Do you find certain cities are easier to match or less complaints from your matchmakers and more success stories? Like how, you know, where are the easy matches being made? (laughs) What cities are they? Yeah, it is interesting. Each story, I mean, each city is unique and they have different challenges. One city that we have a ton of success in is DC. Oh, interesting. I think it's because the people in DC are really career oriented and ambitious. And it's a lot more about who you are as a person and your ambition versus uh, like a Hollywood that's a little bit more superficial. Mm -hmm. So DC, we have a lot of luck in DC. We, I mean, really in, in all the cities, New York is great. We just have tons of people. It's our largest market. So we find it pretty easy to match in New York. Billy, the Bay Area, Orange County, like they're, they're just all so different. But LA, I think the biggest challenge is, is the Hollywood aspect. And that is just slightly more superficial than some of the other cities. So you're saying DC, in your opinion, based on your work and the people that you've worked with, DC seems to be less superficial with the looks and yes. more uh, focused on who they are and probably easier to match them like that. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're still adorable couples, but they're just focused more on personality and core values and career than yeah. some of the other cities. So but they're all so you, every single one is different. <laughs> like New York has more women than men. The Bay area seems to have more men than women. Yeah. yeah. And so we found during COVID that a lot of people were open outside of their city. It never was the case pre pandemic. So we have a ton of success stories now that are like Philly, New York or Chicago, Boston. And that that's helped a lot. Oh, that's great. I mean, that opens it up, right? Like, but if they're far away, do they just do like a video call first or just a phone call or do they make plans to meet in the middle? Like what, how do you guys do it? Yes. So I just had a client an hour ago, I got this update. So he's in 
the Bay Area. She's LA. They did a video call last night. They hit it off and now he's flying today to LA to take her out to dinner. So mm -hmm. usually that's the case. They'll do a video call and then they'll coordinate a time to meet in person. I think video calls are great. Like today's world, like Zoom, I mean, even if you don't put on makeup, you can still look good because Zoom helps you with that, right? Like <laughs> Zoom is like clearing up my skin for me right now. It's taking away some of the wrinkles. But yeah, I feel like video dating has really picked up for me too. Like people are more open versus, you know, they probably wouldn't meet someone on the East coast, if they're in LA, but now they're like, Oh, I might as well. I'm on zoom all day long. I know how to do it. I feel comfortable doing it, but I do advise the people who are not used to doing video dating that they practice. They just practice with their friends and practice with the lighting and the background and all that stuff. I mean, it, it could be a huge advantage to meet someone in another city or even another country. Like if I was single right now, I would be totally meeting men in different countries where I eventually could move to, right? Like I could move to Greece, I could move to Italy, I could move anywhere. Like it's such an amazing opportunity for people out there right now. What, I mean, what do you think about that? I totally agree. And we have a handful of clients that are all over the world. Like we have a client in Brazil and one in Amsterdam, Puerto Rico, and they're able to be matched with our matches in the U S well, Puerto Rico. So anyways, it is really helpful, but you're exactly right. Like you have to treat it like a date. It, you can't be walking around your house and doing laundry. It, like you just have to sit down with lighting and maybe a candle and treat it like a date. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So what would be some dating tips you would give men out there in LA? Cause you know, LA is a different market, but let's talk about LA. Cause you know, my company is based out of LA as well, but some different uh, dating tips you would give men that you normally don't hear things that you found to be helpful with your male clients. Like what are some thoughts and some tips on that? Yeah, definitely with the guys, I always say this, but consistency wins in the end. Like a woman will date a handful of guys at the same time, but the guy who's consistent will always win. So it's going on the date and following up and doing what you say. And usually that will get you to the finish line that alone, because most people aren't consistent. So being the good guy, the other thing, both men and women must communicate and not make assumptions. So for example, if you're going on a date, at the end of the date, you need to tell the person you're actually interested in a second date. Otherwise they might assume that you're not. And it's not even enough like for the women to say, oh, thank you so much. I had such a nice time. Like, that's not good enough. It's thank you so much. I had a wonderful time. I'd love to see you again, or we should do this again. Because as matchmakers, we get the post-date feedback. So I've seen so many times that people are making assumptions that are inaccurate and they think the other person's not interested. So they don't ask them out on another date. And so uh, you have to be so clear, both men and women at the end that you are wanting to see them again, that goes such a long way. Otherwise you'll miss opportunities. Yeah. Sometimes I get the post-date feedback and I'm like, wait, is this the same date? Like you guys are talking about two different things. And yeah, but I, I agree. I like what you said, that consistent part with the men. If you like the woman, you should make plans to see her again, invite her out again. I always say, give her an offer that she can't refuse. Like you guys already talked about your different activities that you like or a different restaurant that you might like or whatever foods you like like make her an offer she can't refuse. So she'll go out with you again. And does that sound like a little bit of bribery? Yeah, maybe, but I mean, you might as well, right? It seems like if you go out on a bunch of first dates, you're probably only going to like 30% of the dates, right? It's not like you go out on five dates and you like all five women, you go out on five dates and you probably only like one or two of them, right? That's only like 20 or 30% or whatever, 40%. So it's like, go for it. Just give her an offer she can't refuse because what if a guy asked her out again and you guys are both just wanting to take her to a pizza place, but who's going to give her the better offer? So she'll say yes. So yeah, yeah I like it's that. so true. Consistent. 
And then also just to make it easier, you don't even have to wait till the end of the date. I think sometimes that can be pretty nerve wracking at the end. If you have a conversation about a restaurant, as you just mentioned, or a band that you like in the middle of the date, just say, we should go together. I'll, I would love to take you to that art museum. And then you're done. Then you don't have to worry about it at the end of the date and you're both on the same page. Right. And then when you're saying goodbye, you can say, oh yeah, remember that museum I talked about? When are you available? Are you free next week, Friday or Saturday? I can, I would love to pick you up. Like, you know, kind of keep it natural. The conversation's flowing. You're closing it off with an offer for another date. Uh, yeah, I love that. That's a great idea because you're right. Like at the end, it's like, ooh, do I kiss him? Do I not? You know, yeah. is he going to ask me out again? Is he like, whatever. So yeah, that's yeah, can great, get great awkward. Tip. Yeah. Okay. So what else, what other tips can you give uh, for women? I mean, we talked about men, how mm -hmm. they should be consistent and ask her out, keep the momentum going and men and women should communicate, right? Let them know their intentions, how they felt about him or her at the end of the date. But what are some specific tips for women at mm -hmm. the end of the date or during the date? Yes. Well, I think just what's most important is to be present, like not to future think. It's really easy on the date to think like, ooh, is he going to be good in bed? Or will he be a good dad or good? Like, stop, just be <laughs> present and have fun and keep an open mind. Like, I believe that if you are on a date with someone and they're remotely attractive to you and they seem kind, it's worth another shot because for women, chemistry can grow and it often does on that second, third, fourth date. I am always looking at our success stories, like data. And one thing I noticed is that the couples through us that ended up getting married, I always look back on their first few dates to see what they said. The men are usually smitten on the first date and they're like, this is it. This is my person. Or at least they're really excited to go on that second date. And the women are usually not there yet. Like they're more cautious. So there's something about them that's interesting and they're willing to give it another shot, but it's not until the fourth or fifth date when they're like, wow, this is my person and I'm glad I stuck it out. So if you are curious to get to know this person more, you have other questions or some mystery, it's just always worth giving them another shot. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if the date was positive or neutral and they look great on paper and they meet 80% of what you're looking for, maybe even 70% of what you're looking for. You should just give them a chance, go for it. You know, it's, again, it goes back to a bunch of these first dates. It's not like you're going to like every single person. And when you do find somebody that you connect with, you should pursue it. You should let them know how you feel about him on the date. And like, wow, you're, you're pretty amazing. I would love to hang out with you again, or I love to see you again, or especially the guys. I love when the guys are pursuing the women. Yes. The courtship. And they love it too. That's what you they know. want. The women want. Right. And it's also just really important after the date to assess how you feel, because a lot of the couples that we matched that ultimately got married, they would say things like, oh, it felt like home. I've just felt really comfortable with the person. So just to acknowledge like how you feel about yourself. And if you feel like a great version of yourself, then that's a very good sign. Yeah. If you feel on edge or you're anxious and, but maybe you have butterflies like that is actually typically not the best sign. <laughs> so what about um, religion? Do you match people based on religion as well or politics? Like what, a, how has that come into play? So we ask all, when we do the intake meeting, we ask them to tell us everything they're looking for in a partner. And then we categorize it into must haves, nice to haves and deal breakers. So often religion and politics ends up in one of those non-negotiable categories. And so if that's the case, then of course we'll match them accordingly. And if not, then if they're more open, great. But if it you know really matters to them, then we won't give them a match outside of that criteria. Yeah. So Talia, if you had to describe your ideal client, age, ethnicity, whatever hobbies, how would you describe a woman that's your ideal client and kind of how she views dating and through mm -hmm. matchmaking? Like, how would you describe yeah. her? 
I mean, really, she can be any age, any ethnicity, like, but she's coming in with an open heart and an open mind and is able to trust the process and work with her matchmaker as a team. The clients that end up as the success stories come in that way. And often they're getting married to someone a little outside their criteria, but it's because they trusted the matchmaker and the process and we did it together. The clients that are the most challenging are the very rigid clients that have a set list of exactly what they're looking for and they won't veer from that because we'll deliver them exactly what they're looking for, but often like that's not who they're meant to be with. So the best clients are the ones that understand like your person might come in a different package than you expect. I totally agree. I mean, it's kind of like in real life, right? Like you see a man walking down the street with this gorgeous woman. You're like, huh, how did they end up together? Like, how did they end up together? I'm like totally curious, but it could be a number of reasons. Like they used to work together and she wasn't really attracted to that type of guy, but as she gotten to know him, she thinks, wow, he's kind of funny and he's cute and he's so smart, you know, like, I just feel like people just don't give people a chance. I just really feel like the women are so hung up on height. Oh, oh I just yes. can't stand that. But yeah, it's I almost know. like if someone is five, three and she's filling out my form and she's like, that guy needs to be six. Oh, I almost feel like just deleting her profile right then and there. I mean, the men are my paying clients and the women join my database for free, but it's almost like a wasted phone call for me to call that woman. If she's so such a stickler on height, you know, it's just, it's like, man, you just better lower your height requirements. Otherwise you're not going to find somebody. It's just, yeah. it's only like 13% of the men in the U S or six O or above. Like it's not even that high. Exactly. And then we assume half are single. So it's half of that. Right. Right. I know. I don't think they realize that I think everyone wants six feet or six one, but you are narrowing the pool so much. And then you add something, one other thing on top of it, yeah. like yeah. religion or college educated, you know, you might have a hundred people in your city. I know. I agree. I agree. And it doesn't even ma make a difference. Like what is going to make a difference in 20 years? Is it that extra inch? Probably not. So you've been married for how long now? Oh my God, I think it's 13 years. We're almost <laughs> okay. at 13. <laughs> okay. So you've been married for 13 years and obviously your husband uh, knows what you do for a living. Like how did he first think about your new career or what did he think about it when he heard that you wanted to start a dating company or, you know, when did you meet him? I met him actually right around the time that I started and I fully match made myself. I walked into a holiday party and I saw him across the room and I turned to the guy next to me. I was like, bring him to me, bring him here right now. And so he walked up and really the rest is history. I just did every orchestrated it myself, but he was great. Like we would go to dinner, we'd be on date nights and I'd see a cute guy walk into the restaurant. I'm like, gotta go. I need that guy. Like he was always supportive. He'd be the photographer at our events. So he's, he does not have like a jealous gene in his body. So it works out perfectly. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been with my husband now. We've been together about 15 years, but we've been married for five. And I don't think he has a jealous bone in his body either. Like I'm on the phone sometimes like late at night, eight or nine or 10 o'clock or whatever. And he's not like, who is that? Who are you talking to? You know, so <laughs> I think it really matters if your spouse supports you uh, in this career, especially you're, you come across so many good looking guys, I'm sure. Right. Like, you know, if he was a jealous husband, it would be such mm -hmm. a difficult job for us. So. Yes. In general, like, well, especially for, for all people, but a lot of times entrepreneurs, I think it's so important to have that supportive partner because it can be a 24 seven job. So it's also, you need to be with someone who understands that, like, this is a huge part of your life. So if you are working at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock, like, yeah. just a partner that understands. Right. I mean, notice, uh, listeners, we did not say that our husbands are tall and he's <laughs> a great husband because he's tall or he's a great father because he's tall, because it doesn't matter how tall he is. It so. really doesn't. 
up until I met my husband, every guy I dated was like five, four, five, five. I'm five, four. I loved it. Like they're the best guys. I loved having, a, I could kiss them whenever I wanted. They were my same height. I, my husband happens to be like a little bit taller, but it's made no difference. Like there are so many gems that are under six feet tall. I know. I totally agree. I mean, I dated a guy that was five, six when I lived in Hong Kong, you know, I'm five, six, he was five, six. I did not care. Like, you know, I never even thought about, Oh, I want to date a tall guy. Like that never even crossed my mind until I started this business and women are asking for tall men. And I'm like, what, what does that have to do with it? Like, it just has nothing to do with love has nothing to do with how supportive he's going to be has nothing to do. If he's going to be able to change a diaper, like whether he's tall or short, he's still going to be able to change a diaper. So yeah. Yeah. Some of the criteria I've had several times, women who are younger and want children, they'll say, I don't think he's a match for me because I'm a morning person. He's a night owl. I'm like, okay, that's a huge bonus. When you have children, then you do the one shift and he does the other. It works out perfectly. Right. Right. And the criteria. Yeah. I, I was a night owl totally like all through my college years or whatever. I used to even work graveyard shifts. Like I worked 10 at night to six in the morning. I used to work at Caro's restaurant when I went to UC Santa Barbara, that was my uh, full-time job while I was in school. So I always like to stay up late. And even now I'm a total night owl, but my husband is a total morning person. He wakes up at like four or five o'clock in the morning and now I have shifted to being a morning person too. So I just feel like I'm missing out on life. So I like stay up late. And then I also want to wake up early because now I have FOMO, like what's going on when I'm not awake yet. So yeah, I don't sleep a lot, but I mean, you can adjust like all these little things that people put on their profiles. It means nothing. Like you're just looking for someone who's a good person, right? Yes. End of story. Like a solid, good human that will adore you and support you and be your best friend. That's it. Like you just have to think a lot of people, I I do feel date short term, but really you need a date long term. Like what are the qualities that are going to make a difference in 20 years and just focus on that? Yeah. And exactly what you said, like, it doesn't matter if you're in your twenties now listening to this or thirties or fifties, like what are those qualities that's going to matter in the long run? That's what's truly going to make or break, make or break your relationship. So I love uh, when I talk to strangers and they're like, oh yeah, I've been married for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. And you're like, wow. And I stop to ask them like, what? what made your relationship so successful? Like your union, like all these years, like, you know, and they're telling me that you really have to find somebody who you can a get along with, right? Like, cause you're probably going to be bored. Sometimes you're just eating dinner across this person and you just have to like, like them, you know, not just Mm -hmm. think they're hot, but you have to like them as their being. So anyway, (laughs) Fully agree with that. Yes. Yeah. So I like, especially for some of the younger ones that are getting married for the first time, like, you have to spend probably 60 to 70 years with this person. So let's make sure that you like them as a human. So what age would you suggest your kids get married? Like what age is a good age? If you had to just give advice to your kids and be like, okay, when you're so-and-so that's when you should think about marriage. Like, what is that number for you? So under, I feel like it's changed so much. I probably, I don't know. Like, I think maybe like, it really doesn't matter. Thirties, something. I mean, I got married, like, I think I was about 30, but like sometime in your thirties, but it really, I see like, it doesn't make a difference. Some of my happiest clients and couples got married in their forties, which is amazing. You know who you are, you have a stable career. So I don't think it makes a huge difference, but it's not as young as it used to be. I think. Right. 20s was pretty standard, but it's not that way anymore. Well, Talia, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, I'm, it's so good to catch up with you. I mean, I haven't seen you in like years, but I always email you and we always collaborate. So I truly, truly appreciate our friendship and our working relationship. And I wish you nothing but the best, but before you go, and if you can give one last tip to the listeners out there and 
also tell us how we can find you. But of course, I'll put all your information in the show notes, but I want to hear from you. Any last parting words? Well, my tip for everyone is to have a dating portfolio and to do all the things because you don't know where your person's coming from. So sign up for those free databases at the very least through many matchmakers. And if you have the time, do online dating and ask your friends and go to events, so you be proactive. And then how, we also have a free database. So you're welcome to join. It's three day rule. You spell it out T-H-R-E-E-D-A-Y-R-U-L-E. So anyone can sign up for free to become um, part of our database. And we work with both men and women and we have an LGBTQ department. So anyone can become a client of ours as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Talia, thank you so much. And ladies, if you're out there, like Talia said, join our free databases. Look us up. Mine is at twoasianmatchmakers.com. And men, I would love to hear from you and work with you. If you're looking for a lovely Asian woman, let me know. And thank you so much, Talia. I will talk to you later. So good to see you. Bye.